Welcome to the second module of the Research Networking Day of CTM Festival 2021. My name is Anita Yori and I'm going to host the next session. I'm research associate at Berlin University of the Arts and also one of the curators of the discourse program of the festival. So the title of this session is Performativity, Tradition and Magic. And when I had to kind of prepare a little lecture about it, that what is going to be the the topic of this session, I was in really in trouble because I was like, okay, there are going to, there are going to be so different topics here. So I thought that let's see what are going to be the overlaps between those lectures who you will, or you will listen to later on. So Emma Lowville, for example, talk about the digitalized versions of East and Southeast Asian instruments developed by European companies and the problematics around this phenomenon from a post-colonial studies point of view. And then Batul Dezuki will bring us into a journey to the Arabic Persian tradition about the potentials of magic in computational research Research. And finally, Luca Sudo will talk about sonic manspreading, an artistic research tool that challenges the gender binary and the Anglo-European invasive perspective of occupying space. So as you can hear, there will be three kind of different topics here, but at the same time, I'm really sure that there are so many overlaps between them. And I really think that this session will challenge some settled epistemologies and propose critical aspects about transcultural sun practices magic, gender, and the sonic aspects of occupying spaces. So be thrilled uh, about those topics. And I would like to uh, introduce the first presenter, Emma Lu, who is a poet and music maker based in Berlin. And she's working toward a master's in modern South Asian and Southeast Asian studies at the Humboldt University of Berlin, with a research focus on cultural transfer of music traditions. And this is going to be the main topic of her presentation. And the title of the presentation is Technologizing the so-called Ethnic Sound. Ethnic, ethnic Sound, I'm sorry. So we will play now this video. Video. Hello everyone, my name is Emma Lowe and I'm a student at the Humboldt University here in Berlin in the program of Modern South and Southeast Asian Studies. I will present my research project to you today titled Technologizing the Ethnic Sound. In recent decades, European virtual instrument production companies such as Sonic Couture and Native Instruments have produced extensive sample libraries of non-Western instruments. Note here some of the language used to market these products, ethnic, totally authentic, discovery series. Of these ethnic products, I am interested particularly in the digital versions of East and Southeast Asian instruments, and my research project will seek to contextualize these products. My research methods are based in interviews with producers, composers, and musicians who engage explicitly with Chinese and Indonesian music traditions. I will analyze these interviews using the concept of cultural transfer, as applied to music sociology and anthropology by Jinna Kim. Cultural transfer on a basic level describes a set of processes that facilitate the mobility of culture, which inextricably stand, as Kim says, in relation to existing social, cultural, and cognitive systems of society. Depending on the power constellation, cultural transfer could take on the forms of circulation, emergence, adaptation, transformation, appropriation, even infection, etc., etc. For me, the term helps to both isolate and connect systems, agents, and institutions for deeper analysis. My approach is trans-regional in the hope of finding meaningful distinctions overlapping and parallels between and across these regions. And I will try to mitigate my own positionality by foregrounding the analytic input of research participants themselves, and to the extent possible, utilizing historical and theoretical work from non-Western scholars. So my main lines of inquiry are, how are these digital instruments situated in the history of musical transfer between Europe, Southeast Asia, and East Asia? In what ways do digitalized instruments differ from acoustic instruments? And what are the impacts of instrument digitalization on the mobility, preservation, and ownership of these music traditions? 
My case study is sonic couture's Chinese and Indonesian instruments. First, the sheng, which is a kind of mouth organ that requires circular breathing. Then there's the gu zheng, which is a plucked zither. Its trademark sound is that of pitch sliding and vibrato, created by applying pressure to the plucked string to the left side of the bridge. Sonic Couture has attempted to capture the nuanced sounds created by these specific techniques. Their digital sheng has a breath direction setting, which produces a slight change in intonation. And their gu zheng, they offer various vibrato settings and pitch bending modules. Likewise, their Balinese gamelan, uh, they've put a lot of attention to detail into it. And the gamelan, which is an ensemble of instruments, composed of various percussive and melodic instruments, uh, is captured by Sonic Couture by over 8,000 recordings. And they have attempted to capture the signature shimmer of Balinese gamelan, through a setting that slightly detunes doubled instruments, which causes this effect. While the production value is high and impressive, it is important to know that Sonic Couture is an English company founded in 2005 by two British men, Dan Powell and James Thompson, who have a background in sound design. In interviews, they have said that what sets them apart from competitors is their affinity for strange sounds. This, along with the Orientalist vocabulary used in their marketing materials, harkens back to a long history of cultural imperialism. To give a very quick and incomplete answer to this question and sketch of the historical background, uh, I'll quickly describe how the colonial period, which was over 300 years of Dutch interference and occupation in, Indo in Indonesia. For China, there was the presence of British imperialism, and these eras brought about the circulation of cultural souvenirs and chinoiserie, which piqued the oriental appetite of European audiences. At the turn of the century, the cultural tourism industry was born in Indonesia, and this increased travel and exhibitions like the World's Fair led to the spread of European and U.S. imitations in their performances and compositions. The Western agenda of cultural diplomacy during the Cold War increased funding for intercultural collaboration. And at the same time, the number of non-native gamelan ensembles in the U.S. as well as Europe and Japan was rising. Recently, over the past several decades, the rise of electronic music and sampling uh, and the development of digital tools have ushered us into an era where old imperialist motifs live on in the updated forms of techno-orientalism and techno-primitivism, which Fatone defines as the juxtaposition of a nostalgia for the primitive and exotic with a reverence for high technology. As we move into the second research question, I begin to feature quotations from surveys I've conducted with artists so far. So in what ways do digitalized instruments differ from acoustic instruments? One area of difference is music theory. While the digitalized instrument may carry the timber, it does not, it is not embedded with the musical rules, uh, says Bilawa Respati, a Javanese gamelan musician. Techniques are also lost. Uh, Kazimin, member of Gabri Modus Operandi, says that it's not only the, about the sound of the gamelan, but also the quality of how it's played. Uwe Sheng, virtuoso, says that a digital instrument captures only 30 or 40 percent of the essence of the sheng. Then there is the issue of the individual control versus an ensemble of players, which is particularly um, applicable to the digitalized gamelan. So traditionally, says Bilawa, gamelan involves group interactions, uh, with each instrument having a specific musical function and responsibility. Moreover, musical rules and idioms are recorded in idiomatic melodies that are unique to each instrument, taking away that ensemble control 
uh, creates a massive difference in the digitalized instrument controlled by one single individual. And a final area of difference relates to live performance, uh, with a reflection from Kassaman about meaningful differences in sound and experience. The beauty of the acoustic gamelan, even the most beautiful mic and speaker, can't really replicate this. Uh, he's talking about a recording of a live performance, and the digitalized instrument is yet one step further removed. And now we'll take a look at the third research question. What are the impacts of, in, of instrument digitalization? One area of impact that several respondents picked up on was accessibility and awareness, that these digitalized instruments increase availability and accessibility to a larger audience. People will have easier access to the gamelan. Here is what Ariel William Ora, artist and founder of Soy Division, is talking about. Uh, the gamelan is multiple instruments, heavy, rare, handmade instruments, and the digitalized version will definitely increase access and maybe spread some more cultural information about the instrument. Uh, it could also be used as a, ped a pedagogic tool because of the reduced cost for teaching gamelan, suggests Bilawa. Another area of impact is innovation. Bilawa says that if this product is used mindfully and critically, it could be useful for the composition of new music. Um, preservation could also be aided. Kassaman asks whether the digital instrument could help with preservation, given the complicated economic, political, and religious contexts in Bali that are, according to him, harming local preservation efforts. There were also anxieties about erasure. So Bilawa identified several areas of potential erasure, such as the endangerment of professions surrounding the acoustic instrument, namely instrument makers, uh, also uh, the, the threat of affecting the sacredness of gamelan, which is still used in rituals and ceremonies. And finally, as mentioned earlier, there is the loss of music theory. And finally, we'll end on a concern from Ariel about ownership, appropriation, and profit. Ariel highlights the significance of who digitalized these instruments and now profits off of them. Uh, and this is as far as I can take you today into the initial stages of my research project, but I'm really looking forward to the next two presentations and to our discussion. Anyone who's interested in my project and has questions or feedback can reach out to me at my email address below. Thanks so much. And I would start at our conversation or dialogue more like with the question of what is the problem with this term ethnic sound? Because you also put it into quotation marks, yeah. Uh, I guess the, the problem with it is that I am approaching this topic from an English language perspective and from a European perspective where I'm based currently. So the word ethnic is the English word that is used to describe these sounds, but the the problem with it is who's doing the describing and who's terming these uh, musics and instruments as ethnic, and it, would it be phrased that way from the musicians themselves? Hmm. Great. <laughs> I thought that it's, it would be a great start to to just clarify it in a way. Thank you so much. Um, my second question would go towards the, the research questions you had and you proposed for your, this is your master thesis, I guess, uh, you're writing now. And I think the first and the third questions are beautifully, could be implemented to post-colonial studies and, and answering them. And I was wondering about the second one because it's really like kind of specific about, and it sounds like that, in what ways do digitalized instruments differ from acoustic instruments? So it's like a huge question in a sense because it could be really analyzed in a way, you know, like musicology wise and um, aesthetics wise and so on and so forth. So there might be a reason why you, you kept this question in like it's a really huge question in the end and let your people who you interviewed to answer this question. And what was maybe your aim with that, that you left it really like opened in a sense? 
Yeah, um, I think these three questions are really big ones. And the first, you know, could be answered by music historians. The second could be answered by musicologists and the third um, by sociologists. And so it's it's a lot to start with. But actually, the I think the second question really was born out of my initial survey with these musicians and composers who um, I didn't I didn't posit that question in that way, but I um, I did ask them if they would if they were familiar with the instrument, the digital instrument, if they would want to use it, or if they have used it or would be interested in using it, and then I asked them about impact. But actually, in their answers to these three questions, really came out an interest in distinguishing what was different about the digitalized instrument, what was lost perhaps in the digitalized instrument or gained as opposed to the acoustic instrument. So I found that there were many articulations that spoke to this second question in the, in the answers to the surveys. Mm. So there was an interest there that I wanted to uh, pick up on. Yeah, okay. Because I was also wondering about those categories you, you wrote like this um, individual versus ensemble or music theory. These are all coming from the survey and from the interviews you conducted with the people. So based yes, on the interviews, I, yeah. Yes, exactly. And since I really have just started this process, I've only, uh, I've only done five surveys, which I want to then expand into full length interviews. And I definitely want to incorporate many more voices in this project as well. So perhaps over time, these categories might change. Mm. Can you tell us some words about those voices who you contacted interviews with and musicians? Sure. So so initially, I've, I've sort of started with some of my own uh, networks. I am a student of a, a traditional Chinese instrument. And I'm, I've also been focusing on Indonesia a little bit in my studies. So I've kind of started with my own personal networks and I, I selected individuals or or invited individuals who, like I said, are explicitly engaging with music traditions. So of course there are, are whole other groups of people who could be a part of this conversation, for example, the creators of Sonic Couture or maybe users of these digital instruments who aren't necessarily explicitly working with traditions, but nonetheless are now I involved with it through the use of this product. So right now, I, I am primarily interested in, in these musicians who are working with traditions, but that might also expand to some of these other users of the product and, and the makers of the product, since I am interested in in those perspectives as well. And I would be also interested in your opinion about this, this problematic around it that, um, you know, European uh, companies make those, those tools happen with this from a perspective of post-colonial studies. Um, because you also mentioned in your presentation that it could be also like a nice kind of transcultural exchange that, you know, the popularity of those instruments are spreading in a sense. But on the other hand, we all know that ethically or morally, it's maybe not the best. So I'm, I'm just curious about your own personal experience and, and opinion on that. Yeah, I, I'm interested to know more about um, the profit structure for this particular product, because I know that at least for their Balinese Gamelan product, they made recordings with two different groups who are based in the UK, two different Gamelan groups based in the UK. So I wonder how those groups were compensated, you know, if those groups continue to receive compensation every time a tool is purchased, I'm not sure. So that, that would be interesting to know, you know, where, what their profit model is, although I, I kind of doubt <laughs> they'll let me in on it. But I think that that definitely changes the dynamics. Um, so profit is a big part of the problematic for me, where, you know, on the one hand, there are these potential positives of um, increasing accessibility to this you know, somewhat obscure instrument in the Global North setting or, or difficult to access. Um, but on the other hand, if it means that uh, if it's based upon this profit model that is only funneled into these 
you know, two British men and their company and neglects the entire community that they have taken this from or extracted it from, if I can use that word, uh, then I think it, there is some there are some ethical questions there. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm, my last question would be, and I'm waiting for the questions also from the audience, so please don't hold yourself back, just write them into the YouTube chat. In the meanwhile, is about, again, back to this kind of methodology you built up that based on interviews, and I know that you are in just the first step in your research. I was wondering about if you're planning to kind of, it's, it's a really bad word to analyze music, but you know, to, to use sonic examples also uh, for like this difference between acoustic and digital tools and if you want to do it or you would like to ask someone else to do it. I was just wondering about that. Absolutely. In fact, I really wanted to incorporate some audio uh, excerpts in the presentation itself, but it became a little bit tricky with regards to copyrights and we just didn't want to risk it. But definitely I would like to include in include that in my research project somehow is to kind of compilate some kind of playlist that allows um, the reader to also listen in on some of the, the references that I and the interviewees are making. Yeah. So definitely. Nice. I'm really looking forward to hear about it and I would really like to read your master thesis when it's ready. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we have to finish, unfortunately, our dialogue because we have to move to the next presentation. But thank you so much, Emma, for being here and also for your wonderful presentation and your answers. Thanks so much. Very glad to be here. <laughs> so the next presentation is going to be about um, computation so we will go to another a different era and Batul Dezuki is an artist and researcher who works with archival material magic and personal history to make computational research projects of variant forms her work has been exhibited at various places such as at Goldsmith in London or Vantage Point uh, Shajan or Shajan Art Foundation and Batul also a uh, co-founder of Tariff a uh, bilingual in independent publishing platform that introduces the world to artists from the Southwest Asian, North Asian region. Uh, she completed an MFA in computational arts at Goldsmith and is currently based between London and Kuwait. So now we are watching her presentation. Hi. Um, before I begin, I just want to note that my notes are off to the side to the camera, so I'm going to be looking off somewhere over there. Um, so the title of my talk today is Program War, which is the title of the research project that I'm going to be talking about to discuss uh, technology and magic and my research on the history of their relationship. I started this research while I was doing an MFA in computational art at Goldsmiths University of London. So it's a practice-based approach that ties in my practice in computational art uh, with my practice in magic talismanic magic specifically, and brings in some of my own cultural background as well, which I'll get into towards the end of the talk. I was uh, guided by Silvia Federici's Caliban and the Witch as a starting point for this research, and I went to it with the aim of remembering the contentious relationship that early capitalism, uh, before the start of capitalism, the formation of capitalism had with witchcraft and magic that Federici describes in her book. I wanted to propose or forge through my work a form of computational magic that honors that early disruptive relationship and opens up a critical engagement with today's technologically driven capitalism. While Federici has a more uh, gender-based focus on witchcraft, the history she outlines brings up several other binaries alongside the gender binary that were based on um, the rationalist divide between science and technology, which ultimately left um, witchcraft, witchcraft separated from technology as witchcraft got um, left in nature and technology got grouped in with science. 
However, um, there are arguments uh, that question whether science, whether technology really does fit in that divide at all, or whether it's under science, or if that binary really does exist. And um, I looked to the work of the xenofeminist working group Laboria Cubonics, who describe how technology helps challenge the science-nature divide by allowing us to change nature. Um, essentially allowing us to ask, instead of asking what is natural, to ask what is possible. And from there, uh, I extrapolated this logic to also dissolve the binary between technology and magic or witchcraft, um, and from that position propose a tech magic or computational magic. So alongside, um, throughout this process, a few keywords came up that ended up structuring the, the body of this work. Um, and those are agency, archive, technology, and magic. I arranged them into uh, pairs to help guide my thinking on these themes and what they can bring up in relation to each other. But because of the time constraint of the talk today, uh, I'll only be, I only have time to go over two of those pairs. Oops. Yeah. So, um, technology and magic. This, uh, this is a magic square. Uh, this is the fundamental block of my work. This is the object that I work with at the center of this research. Um, and basically what this is, it's uh, a grid, it's a matrix of numbers and that needs to fulfill certain rules in order for it to be called a magic square. And uh, the rules vary in complexity as the, as the squares vary in complexity, but this is the most simple square and the most fun simple rule is that the numbers in every column and every row and every diagonal axis must be arranged in such a way that they uh, add up to the same constant. In the case of this square, that constant is 15. Um, these squares appear in several regions at several different times, um, but I focus on their Arabic tradition and uses. They're generally a computational artifact um, that date, date back to early, I think, Chinese dynasties. But anyway, looking at the structure, we can guess how we can place these in the realms of math and technology. However, it is their talismanic uses and their magical uses that further likens them to computation. And that is why I chose to work with them to create a computational magic. So instead of asking whether there's a space for magic and technology, we can actually trace the roots of computing itself as, as a function um, in the mechanics of magic. Florian Kramer's book, uh, Words Made Flesh, offers a description of the technical principle of magic and likens it to the technical principle of software, of computer software, um, as magic essentially aims to control matter through the manipulation of symbols, while um, the use of symbolic logic and the syntax of coding languages allows a program to execute functions and make changes and run processes within a system. Similarly, in magic, tools like talismans and spells use symbols and um, the powers attributed to those symbols to then charge an object and give it a task to carry out in the world. Um, so given this parallel, um, when magic is, context is contextualized in the space of technology, it is often actually described as something not very systematic or intentional at all. It's placed in, um, it's placed in the break of an otherwise predictable orderly system. It's essentially given the space of glitch. This somewhat neutralizes the intentional and agential forces of magic and can echo the process of assimilation that witchcraft underwent into capitalism. Um, whereas witchcraft was given a really narrow and commodified outlet um, for versions of itself that were more attuned to entertainment or leisure or trivial pursuits that took away the agency of magic. Similarly, even though the glitch is an opportune moment for an entry into a system, the usage of the word glitch um, centers the vocabulary and the well-being of 
the of the bigger system of of the predictable orderly system instead of creating more space for alternative agencies so i wanted to move magic away from the space of, un of unpredictability by reintegrating the technical aspects of magic with the technical practice of coding for program war uh, i built a program that generates all the sigils of the smallest magic square <clears throat> and um essentially index, indexes them and archives them and saves them in a kind of auto-archival process that creates um, PDF files of, 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 the, um, of the sigils that it produces um, in a kind of like grimoire of sorts, hence the title of the project. Um, I used a combinatorial algorithm, which parses through all the permutations of the grid, and I chose this approach because it centered the computational process itself of counting and adding up and rearranging for every single frame, every single permutation. This is a back-end view of the same program. Other construction methods, um, like if I were to use a machine learning model or even several medieval algorithms, they all assume that the machine must know the solution and then endeavor to either find a faster way to getting to it or assume that the machine has a sense of spatial awareness and it can place the numbers next to each other in the harmonious, achieve, uh, in the harmonious arrangement that achieves a magic square. But through using Combinatrix, I wanted to include the machine in the process of creating the work, letting it discover the magic sigil for itself as it runs through the math for every single permutation. Even though this was a much more intimate and intuitive method, it was technologically inefficient. It took a lot of time and often ran out of processing memory and storage space. And that <laughs> brought up several questions about techno-solutionist uh, techno assumptions about how to work with technology and what working with technology should look like or what it should do. Essentially, when I distilled the number of problems that came, challenges that came up, it was highlighted that the two main parts of productivity is what's being challenged here, and that is um, work and time, the notions of work and time. So when I started to work with this magic square, um, I chose the three by three because it's the smallest and the simplest. But it so happens that it's also the square associated with the planet Saturn, uh, ruled by Kronos, who is the god of time. The Arabic word for magic is sihr, which encompasses most of what the word magic means, but also shares a root in Arabic with the words for dawn and dusk, and can attribute magic to certain times of day. In Arabic, the term tal uh, talisman is talasim, which means exactly the same thing. However, when a talisman is cast onto a, an object to create the talismanic object, uh, which is usually a piece of cloth that includes a magic square and some words, in this case it's a plate. Um, this object is then referred to using the word amen, which is actually the same word for work in Arabic. So a talisman becomes a work. Through this linguistic connection with Arabic, uh, I was able to find a parallel to the interrogations on techno-solutionist beliefs of work and time within the magic square itself as a historical artifact. This practice can offer an alternative modality of doing work and governing time. At this stage in the research, I'm discovering more questions as I give different forms to this research. Um, and as I work with bigger squares and the complexities get bigger. However, um, for now, it's offered an agential reclamation of magic that is not just relevant to technological practices, but also is engaged in a critical conversation with them. Um, as a result, of um, the predominantly capitalist use of technology, a critical engagement on the predominantly capitalist use of technology, um, and offered an alternative where magic can be a system that doesn't need to wait for spontaneous channels to open or for a glitch to break a system. Program War is kind of a long-winded way to offer a technically justifiable belief in magic. I think that's the end of my time. Thank you so much. Hi, Batul. <laughs> Thank you so much for your nice presentation. I was wondering how many combinations do you have on your, in your archive? So actually, the, the smallest one that I'm working with 
produces nine factorial combinations. That's something like 6,900,000 or I don't remember the number. It's large. Oh, uh, yeah. I got it. But is it lim it's limited, right? So I'm, I'm a super naive yes, person so in nice. that. Yeah, it's limited. So it's not like an unlimited yeah. amount of perfect. OK. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you, you talked about those binaries such as nature versus technology, witchcraft versus, versus technology, computation versus magic. And I was, I was wondering about it, that are those binaries are so divided still nowadays, especially if you think about, for example, science and technology studies, which kind of try to close this gap between those binaries. So what is your opinion about that? It's a long-winded path to find where exactly the binaries are now because they're there, they're just a lot more subtle. Um, because there's a lot of interdisciplinary studies now and people, it's, it's, it's more common to cross over between these spaces, but at a certain point, um, things become hard to articulate across spaces and that's where you know that there's like a leftover binary and i came across this when i was trying to articulate magic within a technological space and it became uh what kept coming up is this notion of like uh, you know the anomaly or the mistake or um when technology kind of stops or fails or glitches that's where people find you know something magical happening um and that was where i felt like there was uh, a divide still to really integrate, you know, the 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 magic across into the tech space. But yeah, yeah. And if you talk about magic, you also mentioned that one of your aim is to to move magic away from the space of unpredictability. And I was wondering about it if if we really move magic away from this space, is it going to be still a magic, or then it's a different category or a different term? So, yeah, I think um, there's there's a difference between the descriptive of something being magical and magic as a practice. And I, you know, things being magical will always be there. It's a matter of fascination, right? But magic um, as a practice is actually so. When when I say like I'd like to move it away from this place of glitch, what I actually mean is I'd like to uh, recognize its its agency as um, as an agency that owns itself. So like there's there's a question of, you know, our perspective onto what we call magical and where it is that we situate ourselves when we call something else magic or when we call something else unpredictable. Um, and so to move it away from glitch, near, like, you know, essentially means um, to recognize the the, the the intentionalities that are outside of the, the the predictable ones the ones that we position ourselves within now because we're speaking from the center of the system so to speak and not the periphery seems like yeah. our conversation about the binaries also uh, kind of advocated the audience because there's the question from dina and asking uh, that i noticed that gender binaries are vocally challenged uh, but we are we rarely hear people say nature and science are the same thing and what do you think about it i'm not sure i get the question so the question is i well, like to get back that the like these gendered binaries are vocally challenged so we often talk about this mm. uh, binary but we don't talk about the fact of nature versus science and what is your opinion on that and why oh right uh, i think i mean um yeah, in the same in the same uh, train of thought as as the as the gender binary, I think. Well, actually, we arrived at being able to attack and, and interrogate the gender binary because we first realized that the science nature binary was, um, you know, fictitious. So it actually one followed from the other. It's and and they're all you know at the end of the day we realize like we're living in a soup kind of. There really isn't any of these things, but. I think that, um, especially when the work of um, Laboria Cubonics and the Zeno Feminist approach, um, it really is about tracing the um, kind of the origin points of like this nature science rationalist kind of enlightenment almost um, that, that, that led us to where, like, you know, to, to talking about the gender binary and stuff like that. So I think that kind of came first, actually. Mm -hmm. And also 
culture versus nature, which is again a very typical one and goes back to yeah. other traditions and histories. Yeah. Um, the next question from the audience. Uh, hi, it's Andrea from the first panel. Uh, can you explain again what you mean by medieval algorithms? So, oh, that's quick. I love this question. Um, so, uh, these 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 squares were uh, basically documented and studied in manuscripts by mathematicians from the medieval era, in um, several regions geographically that were technically under like an Islamic empire at different times of the medieval, whatever is called the medieval, it's, it's kind of a broad window. And within those manuscripts, they list as like steps, like instructions to create these magic squares. And um, these instructions, I mean, they're called construction methods, but they are algorithms. Uh, you can follow them and, and like use them to create a code um, to make a computer execute a magic square. Um, they the, the reason I didn't use those though is because they're very visual, they're very spatial, they're based on uh, placing things on a plane, on a, on a paper essentially. Um, yeah, so in that sense, they're medieval algorithms. That's kind of what I meant. I hope that answers my question. I think so. And I think I have yeah. time for one last question. Um, in one of your slides, you, you showed also Ramon Lowe's uh, example and probably from another uh, book from Florian Crema. And um, yeah. I was wondering, it's still, let's say, a European kind of example, even though his ideas were based on, on Arabic tradition and Arabic mathematics and also astrology. Um, can you tell us some, some examples or name some examples also from the Arabic Persian tradition, mathematicians or logicians you, you work with or you do research on just to kind of open up? So yeah, 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 yeah. A really good resource is the work of Jack Tichiano, who uh, maybe in the Discord I can share the spelling of these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so he's um, he does a really good in-depth study on the Arabic manuscripts, and some of his books actually republish the Arabic in the original language. And he works specifically with the mathematical uh, history. He does he does math and science history, so he. Um, he's not talking about cultural magic at all. He just discusses the magic squares as a comp as, as a mathematical structure. So he's really great. Uh, Florian Kramer is really good for kind of providing an alternative history to computing. Um, he really goes back into like ancient code and ancient coding practices. So yeah, those are two um, really good resources. Um, there are, I mean, there's. Um, a researcher at the British Library uh, called Benjamin Hallam, who I have had the honor to meet and actually sit down with and take some, you know, direct guidance from. I can also put his name in the Discord. So, so there are other people also working on magic squares, but you know, it's disparate. So it's all over the place. You have to hmm. uh, really look for it. Yeah. 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 Okay, and we have. Just like one final question also from the audience. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your archi archival research process and experience and how you gained agency over that? So archival processes. So, I mean, OK, the archive came up um, in two big ways. That's why it became a keyword, keyword in the structure of the research. Um, one was, of course, digging into the archive and finding it's really hard. It was it was kind of challenging to find um, material archival stuff on magic squares because they're actually very abstract. They're more of a you know they're more of an instruct set of instructions. Um, but then I again confronted the archive while I was building the program, and it was uh, you know I had to get it to auto record itself, and in that sense you know ask all all the all the big archival questions of like what is worth what is worth recording, how much, um, you know, storage space, speed, access, indexing, you know, finding it later, being able to search, and so the, the practice of archiving kind of came up um, more than me having to work within an archive. 
Thank you so much. And I think this is the time when we, unfortunately, we have to finish. But thank you so much for sharing your artistic research practices. And um, thank we, you. Yeah, we hope to see your also exhibitions and work very soon. Also, maybe in Berlin, too. Thank you oh, so I much. Hope so. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Basel, uh, yeah. for thank being you. with us and also for Bye. the presentation. So now we have to move to the next uh, presentation and um, the title of the presentation is Sonic Manspreading, an artistic research concept by Luca Sudo. And Luca has an academic research background in noise theory, queer feminist methods of inquiry and new materialism. They studied cultural st analysis at the University of Amsterdam and have developed the research based art practice since they're enrolled in the Department of Critical Studies and and Sandberg Institute and their work consists of academic and non-academic writing, performative lectures, tender listening practices, installations and sound pieces which aim to blur the line between theory and practice. So now we are going to watch Luca's video. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be speaking here and I'm very excited about the program. So, my name is Luca Sudant and I'm currently based in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands. I work at the intersection of gender studies, post-humanist feminism and sound studies. I don't really switch and alter my research between these disciplinary fields, rather I'm interested in their relationality, so on how they connect. This concerns questions of where the human body starts and ends, what agency means if we take non-human actors into account, how vibrations or vibrational thinking is helpful in this line of thought, how we can think gender as event rather than fixed ontological status, and what this could all mean for imagining radical forms of justice. On top of working transdisciplinary, I work with academic as well as artistic research methodologies. This means that on top of performing close readings and textual analyses of academic sources, I complicate my research with sound experiments and compositions, which inform and are informed by my engagement with theory. So today I would like to pick out one self-coined research concept that I've worked with over the past two years, which is sonic manspreading. On top of that, I want to talk about how I see sound as a transformational matter. So, manspreading is commonly used to refer to masculine bodies in public transport sitting with their legs wide apart, thereby covering more than one seat. It's a popular term on social media that signals masculine bodies taking up disproportionate space at the cost of space available to others. Manspreading as a concept has predominantly been constructed through images, such as the Instagram posts over here. As you can see, it has a horizontal and occupational character. And it's at this point that I started thinking, what if we, t if we consider the occupation of space not only as a visually perceivable and representable phenomenon, what can be said about manspreading if we consider sound as a space-taking matter? We live in an image-focused world, and this trickles down to how we have come to think about gender and the performative. When gender performativity in academia, the arts and popular media discourse is made more concrete, it is commonly approached from a vision point of view. It is about the looks of the body, of clothes, of accessories, of body movement, of hair. And if it is about sound, it is often about the human voice and not about the sound of, for instance, jewelry, ticking nails on a surface, the sound of brushes, metal, leather, vacuum cleaners and motor vehicles. In other words, there seems to be a lack of analytical attention toward the sound produced at the gendered encounter between the human and the non-human. So I am interested in the moment when organic and inorganic bodies generate sound. I am interested in interrogating these encounters for their performativity, and especially in relation to, gen to gender. I therefore coined the term sonic manspreading, 
which has ever since operated as artistic research term that focuses on the acoustics of space-taking, Eurocentric and colonial constructions of masculinity that dominate and oppress on a global scale. As a term of departure, sonic manspreading has moved through various projects, community-based work, performances, audio works, installations, and my writing practice. It attempts to engage with the performative as a vibrant matter, literally. One example of a work in which the term plays an important role is a sound piece that I framed as a meditation on sonic manspreading. It is an attempt to think about power formations by and through sound and not merely thinking or theorizing about it. So in a space with a surround sound system and subwoofers installed uh, inside a wooden seating platform, as you can see in the image over here, um, I asked people to sit down or lie down and close their eyes. There were instructions present that informed the audience about it being a meditative moment, in the sense that meditation means intensely focusing on something. In the 10 minute composition, I layered various field recordings on top of each other. You can hear a street situation recorded in a busy nightlife alley in a small town in the Netherlands. You can hear cars pulling up in a show-off manner and people singing, shouting and spitting on the ground. Once in a while you can also sonically spot someone kicking against something. Another layer in the composition consists of a close-up recording of a friend who went to a soccer match. In the background you can hear the choirs of football supporters collectively singing and shouting. Throughout the work, the sound intensifies in that the intervals between loud moments become shorter. On top of that, an increasing deep and high BPM kick drum beat gains volume so that it vibrates the surface the audience is situating on. The piece ends abruptly into a resonating silence, which is a very important part of the piece. Similarly to how low-frequency sound waves might heavily vibrate a lightweight object and barely move a piece of stone, one human body responded significantly different from another human body to the artistic and theoretical engagement with sonic manspreading. For instance, during the meditation on sonic manspreading, one person felt nauseous by the combination of low-frequency sound vibrations and the emotional impact of the field recordings. Another person had to laugh as if, they were ob as if they obviously recognized the hindering side of ways in which masculinity takes up disproportionate space through sound. These responses show how theory is not a disembodied practice and how there is difference in emotional and affective engagements with theorizing power. To think about the performative as vibrant matter that includes the whims and forces of all sorts of matter, human and non-human, sound can work to signal archetypal and binary gender formations. However, I simultaneously believe in a truly transformational character of sound that can work to move beyond binary forms of thinking about gender and the performative. So just as sound is inevitably shaking up matter, may it be on a very small atomic level or tangible and visible to humans, theory can likewise perform material shockwaves in the body and alter its assemblage. Just as different frequencies move our cells on another vibrational pace. Whether these corporeal shockwaves are of uncomfortable or joyful nature, when these waves are simultaneously sonic and theoretical, I believe one can move through certain moments and experience those as intimately transformative. Just as being amongst tangible sound waves, such as feeling the bass in your chest during a concert, doing theory with sound and not only about sound can help to bend perspectives impactfully. When approaching transformation, I take the specific spelling of trans with asterisk from Jack Halberstam. 
Halberstam argues in favor of the term trans with asterisk because since the punctuation mark points to multiple directions, it resists polarization and sheer binary between trans men and trans women. Within and beyond thinking about gender, the spelling of trans with asterisk forbids any definite meaning of what transness suggests and opens to endless possibilities of what a transition or transformation entails. Halberstam argues that the asterisk might be understood as a question mark or a sign that emphasizes the transitioning process instead of the final form. Beyond signaling rather stereotypical formations of gender through highlighting its acoustics, I would like to propose a hopeful and future-oriented way of thinking about gender as a process-oriented rather than an outcome-oriented phenomenon. Through sound and vibrations, I strongly believe that we can rethink and expand the notion of gender and to think of it as something that erupts in time and space rather as something that is. Like sound, gender comes and goes. Just as sound is able to pierce through all sorts of bodies and is never identical in how it vibrates the material structure of one object from the other, I believe gender to be truly non-binary and a doing rather than a being that is unique to each individual body. So to conclude, what I generally hope for with thinking gender performativity through sound is to think gender as event, a fluid process-oriented phenomenon rather than a fixed ontological status. This is helpful on a broader scale beyond thinking about gender. Theorizing through and with sound is helpful in recognizing many more shape-shifting site-specific power formations. So this was my contribution. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to answer questions. Hi Luca. <laughs> very nice hey. presentation, super inspiring also topic-wise. Um, I was wondering about the movement of men spreading and then you know opening space or occupying space if you have used for any of your pieces and artistic pieces the sound specifically of opening the legs no i haven't thank you for the idea though because <laughs> i was like um, there will be a place where it's coming in your presentation i was really waiting for that and now this is the sound of opening the legs <laughs> No, that itself I haven't uh, used exactly, but I did use the idea of um, masculinity as more a horizontally spreading phenomenon or constructed as something horizontal versus femininity being constructed as something vertical. And also frequency-wise, I use that as a way of connecting low frequencies to the idea of taking space and high frequencies as the idea of limiting space although i think it's much more complicated than that but i do find it interesting to think also about yeah the um, horizontality of um space taking and how that is also connected to masculinity in the cultural construction of it basically yeah yeah, you also mentioned that this this man spreading the situation of man spreading can be also interpreted as a typical colonialist way of occupying space. And I was thinking about it if you have any intake on that or you use this perspective of it uh, in your work too. Yeah, I mean, essentially, the gender binary is a European colonial tool of oppressing um, indigenous people. And essentially also the um, characteristics that are attached to masculinity versus femininity are colonial um, tools of exploiting people. So I think it's not necessarily the spreading as a characteristic that is um, that is colonial specifically, but the whole system is. Mm -hmm. So it's part of that system. It's it's um, part of um, systems of categorizing people and therefore being able to exploit and dominate and violate mm. bodies. 
um, which is essentially a European colonial tool. So um, I think it's not per se the act of spreading or taking space horizontally. It's more an outcome of that whole system. Um, Understand, yeah. 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 Nice. Uh, I think we have also a question from the audience, and I will just uh, yeah. read it out again, Andrea, from the first panel. And Andrea is asking, can you ex expand further on what you said, that you are interested in the movement when organic and inorganic moments generate sound? And thanks for the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's actually um, becoming more and more my focus of research. And uh, maybe it's also interesting to mention another example that I've been researching, which is um, was a proposal by a crisp brand, so crisps to eat, uh, to develop a lady-friendly crisp. Um, and the sound of the crisp was supposed to be um, lower in volume, so they changed the, the structure of the crisp um, to create less sound when you eat it. So in that sense, I became really fascinated about the absurdity of that proposal, but also how telling it is and how much it reveals about the way we think about gender as a sonic phenomenon between human and non-human bodies. Um, so the, the encounter of the crisp in my mouth would be a gendered and sonic phenomenon, which is um, wild to think, but still very interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. And another example um, is the vacuum cleaner, which is also an interaction between a machine and a body. And obviously, it's a very feminized domestic um, machine. And unlike other machines, um, usually machines show power by being loud and they're not muted. But the vacuum cleaner specifically has been muted through history. And I think it is um, totally entangled with gender dynamics and expectations of the interaction of certain bodies with machines and what kind of sounds those interactions are allowed to produce and what kind of sounds they're not allowed to produce. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you can look from vacuum cleaners to crisps and see that the sound production in the encounter between humans and non-humans is very gendered. Um, yeah. I think uh, we have also a very nice related question from Dina. Thank you, Luca. I'm wondering what your process was for integrating your choice of specifically the football match. So, which is again very uh, kind of a masculine thing, you know. True. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think it's also a point where I've moved a bit away from right now because this project is a few years ago. And back then I was looking a bit more into stereotypical and archetypal spaces such as the gym and the football match situation or the um, loud bar area spaces, which I, I think are interesting to research also for their not very obvious sounds, but also the small sounds that happen there that are policed in certain ways. But also I've moved away a bit more from that stereotypical space and look a bit more into the subtle and um, daily encounters between humans and non-humans um, as gendered situations, rather than looking at the obvious spaces. Although I still think it's um, they're interesting spaces to see to be confronted almost with the absurdity of loudness and which bodies are culturally entitled to perform that loudness and which bodies are not. But also, as I said, I think I became more interested in thinking beyond the voice, thinking beyond music and language. I'm really at that encounter between humans and non-humans. Mm, nice. Maybe also related to that, I was also wondering about, because you mentioned that after one of your performances or an installation, you said that, of course, every single body has a different reaction with that. P 
piece of installation. And I was wondering about it because you said that some people said or reacted like this way or that way, that how did you kind of measure it? Or did you ask the people? Or you said that you want to move away from language. So obviously, you didn't ask them. But did you observe mm -hmm. the bodies? Or did you, what, what kind of tool yeah. you used, in a sense? Yeah, I think it's it's not, there wasn't really like interviews or very uh, constructed research mm. methodologies behind that, but I started noticing that sometimes you can create a sense of community in a space with certain people by humor. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but if you make a joke that's related to the way you're oppressed, basically, and some people recognize that and they laugh in an audience, you can kind of form that community vibe in an, aud in an audience with members that don't really get that joke. And I think that happens sometimes when I mentioned the word sonic men spreading, some people just had to laugh and you kind of instantly know through the, the specific way of laughing that people recognize that very much from their daily encounters or daily experiences. So I think that was a funny observation that through humor, then sometimes you can really instantly create that um, feeling of belonging together in a space that doesn't necessarily belong together. Um, but yeah, just dropping the word sometimes, that's also why the word itself also existed in different projects uh, through talks afterwards or through um, like work descriptions that I noticed that dropping that word sometimes caused this humorous situation where um, you instantly feel like, okay, but these people probably know what that feels like. Anyway. I thought that I thought so that you're gonna give kind of this answer because I was like that you might have as also as an artistic research or you have an artistic research practice kind of a different way of of going towards this phenomena than you know classical academics where we want to make interviews and I don't know you write then afterwards a scientific paper and I was also wondering mm -hmm. if you could recommend to academia like a different way to to express not except mm -hmm. you know just writing a paper of something because you said that you want to move away from writing about sound or working with mm -hmm. about the sound, but you want to work with the sound also in your research, in a sense. Yeah. I feel maybe somehow the secret message is also to loosen up a little bit. <laughs> I'm not, I hope it's not rude to say this, but I feel also working with sound, you need to loosen up in a certain way. You need to be open to more than just the theoretical to reach you, but also to the embodied and the um, vibrational to reach you. Otherwise, you cannot make sense of that moment. And I feel, um, yeah, just, I mean, I come from academia and um, to imagine a sound experiment with um, theorists, I mean, I think it, it rarely happens and I think it would add so much to the tangibility of theory and essentially theory is very embodied and very effective, relational, emotional and I think it's sometimes bizarre that we don't engage with it in a more haptic way and that I think sound is very useful for to really loosen up and open up and create a vibe. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I think these are yeah. really nice ending words for your presentation because unfortunately we have to leave it there. Our 10 minutes are gone. Thank you so much, Luca, also for being here and for your Thank presentation you. and for the nice answers. And all of the presenters from this session are going to be on Discord chat now. So feel free to just go there. If you still have a couple of questions in your mind, then address them there because they are going to be there. So we are back in 30 minutes with the third session.